So in chapter five, right, this is what we dealt with. We dealt with a periodic inventory, okay? We got to take a look, right, how we purchase it by recognizing um, the purchase of inventory as an expense first, okay? And a few things here is that we learned the difference between periodic and perpetual inventory, okay? And we learned, also learned um, shipping as well, the difference between the shippings, okay? We learned how to journalize um, the uh, purchase of uh, periodic inventory, right? And we also remembered that when we talk about inventory, it's going to include all the cost it takes to get the inventory asset to your store, okay? We also talked about, of course, when we have um, purchases, we also have to figure out what happens when we have some purchase uh, discounts and things like that. If we have purchase discounts, which is normal, right, we're usually given terms, which means it's usually a percentage and you're given a discount due date and then you get an overall amount that is due, okay? And we have two choices on how we want to record that, whether it is recording it um, using the net method, which is taking the discount out immediately, okay? Where, or we usually normally do it as a gross method, which, you know, we record it at full price, okay? And of course, we also have to assume that what happens when we end up returning our items, right? We must create a contra account called purchase returns and allowances, okay? And so on and so forth. And we learned how the difference between getting a full refund and then getting an allowance, which is a portion of the money back, okay? We also learned about the conversion entry that happens at the end of the given accounting period. Okay, so that's what the inventory worksheet is for. So you can calculate all your numbers. So then you are able to complete the conversion entry at the end of the given accounting period. Right? And then here's a quick overview of how the costing methods work. Right? We learned three costing methods in this class. And only three. Right there, but there's a fourth one. Okay, when we learn about uh, FIFO, we're going to start from the top and make our way down to the bottom, right? Because the first ones in are going to be the first batch that you, uh, that you sell out first, okay? Where LIFO, instead of going from top to bottom, you're going to go from bottom to top. So selling the latest ones that came in first, okay? And of course, last but not least, right, we talked about weighted average where we don't care what batch came first or what batch came last. All we care about is the total quantity and the total total cost and spreading its cost evenly amongst the total um, number of quantity or units that you have, right? Getting an estimated oh, average cost per item, which then that means um, it doesn't matter how many you sell, they're all going to be the same price, okay? Then we talked about chapter six, which was uh, was periodic sales, where we took a look at what happens when we sell a product, right? Whether we received um, cash or we had it on um, accounts receivable, right? We recognize sales, right? And sometimes there's sales tax, right? In this case, there's no sales tax here. But we also got to take a look at what happens when we have to issue a return or an allowance. Same idea here, right? The difference between a full refund and then giving a portion of the money back. And of course, we also took a look at learning the, um, the difference between the discounts, right? Whether we're doing it with in-store. If you're doing it with in-store, right? Here's how it has to happen, right? We're going to recognize the sales discount first. We're going to recognize the sales at full price. And then we're going to charge the tax based on the discounted amount. Now, of course, when we remember this, right? The only thing that we can discount is only the actual selling price. You cannot discount sales tax or shipping. Okay, and of course, if you record sales tax, right, uh, especially when we're looking at uh, what happens when we sell, 
okay, on an account and we give terms, which is a condition when the customer pays, right? That's the condition. Uh, that's where um, we calculate uh, because since we made the sale, right, and we have to charge tax, we have to give back the sales tax because we originally charged it at full price. But because if they do meet the discount due date, we have to kind of reverse the transaction just a bit and, um, you know, um, discount the selling price, but also give back a portion of the sales tax back. And of course, we got to take a look at both ways, right, uh, where, um, if they meet the discount period, then we take the discount. If not, then they just pay in the regular way, okay? If they miss the discount due date. So that's the few things that we learned in chapter six. And of course, last but not least, we went over the lower cost of market, okay? This is when inventory, right, eventually loses value over time due to the market or due to technology. Um, so... Um, due to just, you know, advancements of just materials in general. Like, you're never going to get a product that's going to use the same materials, right? Because materials end up improving or we get a shortage of materials or it just can't be produced anymore. So in this case, that's what the lower cost of market does is it, it remeasures and values, uh, revalues the um, inventory and depending on the cost too, right? We're looking at what the market tells us it is, right? And we're going to compare it ourselves, right? By looking at the ceiling price, the floor price, the replacement cost, and then determining the market from that. And once you determine the market, then your uh, last thing that you have to solve for, well, which one's lower? The original cost that you purchased it at or the rep or Again, the market cost, right? That's what lower cost of market is. Lower cost or market, excuse me. So again, these uh, the first two, the ceiling and the floor are calculations while um, the market is a comparison as well as the lower cost of market as well. It's also a comparison between the numbers. Okay. And that is it. So let's go ahead and dive right in to the exercise here, okay? Right, so here, this is where we left off. Question number 25, okay? What are the tracking methods used uh, in inventory? A. A, right? Periodic and perpetual, yes, right? We learned a different little different concepts in here, right? B is calendar versus um, fiscal year. Not really have to do it with um, inventory. And cash basis versus accrual basis. Also, once again, not really involving inventory. And accounting period and accounting cycle. Obviously, you guys should know the difference between that. Right, the accounting period is when you schedule the accounting cycle to be completed. While the accounting cycle, once again, is um, the 10 steps that you have to successfully complete um, to properly close out the book. So periodic and perpetual is your only answer. Okay. Number 26, okay, what are the costing methods used in inventory? Yes, it is D, all the above, okay? Now, we haven't talked about perpetual just yet, but perpetual has the same exact three methods. So, in actually overall together, there's a total of six, okay? It are seven, including specific ID. But in this case, right, the concept is the same, except the way that we cost it under perpetual will be slightly different, okay? Um, we don't wait till the very end. So really, in reality, there, there's no real difference because the idea is the same. The only slight difference is just how we actually cost it out, okay? And again, we're going to learn that um, after we come back from the exam, okay? But yes, D, all of the above is correct because these are the only ones that exist here, okay? 
Okay. Of course, there's also actually more than just LIFO, FIFO, and uh, weighted average that's moving average. There's a lot more than that, but these are the most frequently commonly ones that you would normally see on a regular day-to-day -day basis or the ones that you commonly see that most uh, merchandising stores use. Yeah. 27, okay. Auto repair shop stocks inventory based on um, car manufacturing brands, models, um, and car parts. This is an example of which of the following inventory costing methods. specific ID is correct, right? In this case, right, I may not test you on it, but I should definitely test you on the idea of what specific ID is because I've mentioned it many times before. But in this case, right, you have to be some kind of business where it does take into a factor of every single detail, including the smaller details. In this case, I am, again, we do not teach it in this class because we don't know. Not all businesses, you know, have this type of merchandising inventory. Okay. Number 28, okay. When delivery charges made on COD, what does that mean? Cash on delivery. Cash on delivery, meaning you must pay at time of delivery. So again, this is most case scenario for anybody that's a third party vendor that isn't associated with the actual vendor themselves, okay? Um, and yes, it is a common um, type of, um, what you would call it? It is, a, it is a type of delivery system that does exist. Okay. It's definitely not currently orders dispatched, okay? It's not code on demand, and it's not um, crate on departure, okay? Close, but they're not. That's not it, okay? 29, okay, what is the definition of periodic and perpetual? B, per periodic means constantly. Mm, no. Oh, a, um, a. a, periodic means once in a while and uh, perpetual means constantly. Yes, okay. It doesn't mean um, at the end of the accounting period um, and then the other one means the beginning of the accounting period. No. Okay, so this is it, right? It's where every which we update our inventory every once in a while while the other one is we do it constantly we're always updating our inventory okay and it will make more sense when we dive into chapter seven when we come back from the exam okay. true or false okay at the end of the uh, periodic um in uh, at the end of the accounting period okay under the periodic um tracking method okay a conversion entry is required or needed. Yes. Okay. And then when we dive into chapter 7 and 8, you're going to notice that you don't really need one. Okay. Because when we recognize our inventory, we actually recognize it as inventory. We don't recognize it as an expense first. Okay. So, yes. All right, here is an example of what I will test you on. Okay, so I'm going to test you on this kind of type of ordeal where I'm going to give you um, a scenario. I'm going to provide you a um, little table here, and I'm going to give you um, a question with four answers, right? So in this case, let's go ahead and work this out. So each one, I will test you on all three methods that we learned. So in this case, right, first thing that we have here is um, your tracking and costing methods are periodic FIFO, okay? There's the word FIFO, okay? 
So let's take a look at this right here. Use the following information um, with the table to answer the next two questions. Okay, so on June 1st, you purchase a total of 100 toys costing a dollar each and a freight cost of $25. Okay, so in this case, it is June 1st. We purchase 100 toys at a dollar each with a freight of 25 Okay, so what's my purchase price here? A dollar. Purchase price, or purchase expense, excuse me. A hundred. Yeah, it'd be a hundred, right? Plus my freight of 25 gives me 125. And because I'm using FIFO, how much is my cost per item here? A dollar and 25 cents, okay? Here, okay, then on June 10, we end up purchasing 200 toys at a dollar 25 with the freight costing $50, okay? So June 10, 200 toys cost at a dollar uh, 25, okay? And um, a freight costing $50, okay? So in this case, what's my purchase expense? Four hundred and fifty plus fifty. No. No. Two hundred fifty said, not four hundred fifty. Okay, so then this becomes 300. So then what is my cost per item? 1.5. Dollar 50, okay. All right, then on June 12th, you end up selling 200 toys at $5 each, no sales tax. What do I do here? Plug in also for uh, for June 12th, quantity is 200 and uh, unit cost is 500 with fees. Now, in this case, on June 12th, I sold my inventory. Oh. So what do I do with my, what do I do with if I sell my inventory? Do I care to keep track of it? Do I plug it into my table? No. No. I don't notice it. Yeah, so in this case, no, we ignore it, right? Because we don't notice or we don't, uh, we don't calculate how much we sell until the very end of the accounting period. So in this case, anything that has to do with sales, we skip over right away, okay? So then on June 15, you end up purchasing a 300 toys at a dollar and 50 cents each with a freight of $75. Okay. So it's June 15, right? We purchased 300 items at a dollar 50 with the freight of 75. So what's my total purchase price here? Four hundred fifty. Four hundred fifty plus seventy five. Five twenty five. Five twenty five, which brings my cost per item to be one fifty 
four? No. A dollar seventy-five. Okay. All right. Then the next thing that happened was on June twentieth, we end up selling two hundred and fifty toys at five dollars each. Again, no sales tax was charged, so in this case, we skip over that. Right. So then, here's the last thing that we have here on June thirtieth. You have a total of a hundred and toys left on hand. So there we are, right? So we have 150 toys left on hand. So therefore, I need to sum up my totals. So in this case, what was the total amount of purchase of items that I actually bought? So how many toys did I buy? 600. 600, okay. What's my total purchase price? Eight hundred. Good. What was my total freight? One hundred fifty. One fifty, bringing me a grand total of nine fifty. Okay. So in this case, I have a total of a hundred and fifty left on hand. So therefore, how many items did I sell? Eight hundred. How many items did I sell? If I have 600. Oh, I was looking at total cost. Which, uh, no worries. No worries. Okay, so um, 450. So in this case, right, what are we looking at? We are looking at the costing method of FIFO. So in this case, which batch am I going to sell out from first? The, uh, the, what did you say, 100? Yeah, the first, the first one, right? 100 at um, $1.25 each, which gives me a total here of $125, okay? Well, okay, so now that I got rid of my first batch, which batch am I going to sell out from next? June 10th. June 10th, right? So 200 at a dollar 50, which is going to equal $300. Okay? So then that gives me a total of 300 that I sold. How many more do I need to sell? 150. 150 at a dollar and 75 cents each. So how much is my grand total here if I sold 150 at a dollar 75? 262 dollars 50 262.50. Okay, so then let's go ahead and bring up my quantity total. So I have a total of 450 units at a grand total cost of 687.50. 687.50. So 687.50. What's my ending inventory? Two hundred and twenty-five. Mm, not two hundred twenty-five. Two sixty-two point five. Yeah, two hundred and sixty-two fifty. Right. We're gonna take our total of nine fifty, and we're gonna subtract the six eight seven fifty, and you should get two six two fifty. Okay. 
So let's answer the questions. Okay, so question number 31. What is the total cost of your ending inventory on hand? So the 50, 150 units. So what is my total value? Right? Because that's what we solved here. My ending inventory was letter C, 262.50, right? Then question 32 asks, what is the total cost of your cost of goods sold? Oh, C? Yeah, good, good. right? Because that's what we solved here, right? So that's an, another example of a FIFO. Now, let's practice the same exact concept here, except you have something different, right? Our, um, oops, where am I? Okay, coming back up, okay. So here, same exact scenario, okay? Um, but in this case, right, our costing method is periodic weighted average, okay? So once again, this is the same exact scenario. So whether you want to copy and paste it or go through it one at a time, the one notion that we have to know is that this is weighted average. So in this case, I'm just going to go ahead and go through it one at a time. So again, June 1st, right? We purchased 100 toys at a dollar each with the freight costing $25, okay? So 100 at a dollar each with a freight of 25. So again, my purchase price is 100. My total cost is 125. Now in this case, do I need to solve for my cost per item? No. no. Okay. June 10 rolls around, we purchased 200 toys at a dollar 25 with a freight costing $50. So again, two hundred at a dollar uh, twenty-five, which gives us two fifty, with a freight of fifty, which gives us three hundred dollars. Right? Don't need to solve for um, cost per item there either. Right? June fifteen, we skip because it's a sale. I mean, sorry, June twelfth, we skip because it's a sale, and then June fifteen, right? We uh, purchase uh, more inventory, right? We purchase 300, uh, wait, hold on, 300 units at a dollar fifty with a freight of 75. Okay, so it is 615, 300 units at a dollar fifty, which gives you 450 with a freight of 75, which gives you 525. Okay, again on June 20th. We end up selling uh, 250 units, so we could skip over that. And on June 30th, we have a total of 150 units. Okay. So as we solved from above, right, we have a total of 600 units at a total purchase price of 800 with a freight of 150, which we get a total of 950. Now, because this is average, this is um, weighted average, right? We need to solve for our average cost per item. So which in this case, right, how do we solve for our average cost per item? Uh, uh, dividing uh, the total cost with the uh, purchase expense. What do you mean by that? What numbers are you looking at? Oh, wait. Uh, quantity, I mean. Good. So in this case, what is 950 divided by 600? Uh, 150, like, 3, 3, 3. Okay. $1.50. 58333333. Three, 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 three. Okay. So, once again, if I have a total of 600 units and I have 150 left, I must have sold a total of 
450 units. Now let's calculate this. 450 times a dollar five eight three 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 three. What is my total cost of goods sold here? Uh, seven hundred and twelve and forty nine eight five. Seven hundred and twelve. Let me see. Okay. So seven hundred. What did you say? Seven hundred and twelve for fifty. Uh, four, uh, 712, 49.85. 4985. So what does that tell you? Um, you gotta round it up. You're going to round it up to 50 cents. 50. Okay, so here you go, 712.50. So therefore, what is my ending inventory going to be? Uh, 700, um, oh, whoops, I think I put it right, right, give me one moment. 237.50? 237.50, okay. So let's take a look at our answer sheets here, okay. Question number 33, okay, what is the total cost of your ending inventory? Two thirty seven. Two thirty-seven fifty. What is the total cost of your cost of goods sold? Hey. Right. Good. Okay. And of course, I want you to practice this last one right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just copy from um, the FIFO here because that part's just going to be the same since it's the same exact numbers. So I'm gonna save you some time here. On the exam, you may or may not get the same exact scenario. Okay, um, so yes, okay. Here you go. All right, this time it is LIFO that we're focusing on. So if I have all this table out completely filled out here, I know that I have sold 450 units, okay? And we have 150 units left. If I'm using LIFO, how am I, which batch of inventory am I going to sell out from first? June 15. June 15 for 300 at a dollar 75, which we know gives us $525. Okay? Now I sold 300, so how many more do I need to sell? 150 from June 10th. Okay, so 150, right? Um, since my June 10th has 200 and my cost per item is $1.50, how much is it going to cost me to sell 150 items at $1.50? Two hundred twenty-five. Two twenty-five. Okay, so here, what are my totals here going to be? If I sold a total of um, four hundred and fifty units at a total cost of seven hundred fifty. Seven hundred and fifty. So then that leaves me with an ending inventory of. Right? Yes. 950 minus 750 will give you 200 left. Yes. Okay. So in this case, question here says, what is the total value of your ending inventory? 200. Okay. 
And then once again, what is the total cost of your cost of goods sold? Seven fifty. Okay. So here I showed you all three methods, right? And this is what I want and I'm going to expect for you to know. Really simple. No returns, no allowances, no discounts, nothing other than just the purchases itself and just figuring out this number. So once again, if you look very carefully at the answers, I have included the answers from all three methods. So to show me that you know the proper way to do this, you need to get the correct answer out of the multiple choice. Okay. All right. Any questions here in regards to the costing methods? No. Okay. All right, that's exactly how I'll ask you. What is the cost of your ending inventory and what's the total cost of your cost of goods sold? Okay. So in this case, let's see what happened here because, uh, let's see, I think um, for the FIFO or the LIFO, it tells me to answer the next uh, questions from questions 35 through 40, okay? So there I answered uh, 35 uh, and 36. So 37 asks, okay, if on June 15, okay, the terms are 5% 15 net 30, and you decided to pay um, pay the um, vendor on June 30th. How much is your purchase discount? So if on June 15, okay, so let's take a look at the scenario. June 15, I purchased 300 units costing at $1.50 uh, with the freight of 75 So how much is your discount? $22.50. $22.50. So here in this case, right, I'm going to take my 300 times the 150 which we know we got 450 right we're going to multiply that 450 because we can't discount the freight and we're going to multiply it by the five percent okay and the five percent right should give you so 450 times 0 0.05 22 dollars and 50 cents so in this case Boom, that is correct, B. That's the amount of discount you're going to get, okay? Uh, number 38, okay? If on June 15, you found 30, okay, assuming that these are separate scenarios, um, you found that 30 uh, of the toys were broken, okay? And you return, the, you return them for a full refund. What is the correct entry? Okay, so if on June 15 you found 30 of those toys to be the raw uh, to be broken, right? And you ask for a full refund. Okay? So you're going to take your 300 units, right? You no know, in this case, how much does it cost me per unit? $1.50, right? If I'm going to return 30 of them, how much is my refund for? Uh, 45 It'd be for $45, right? Now, let's take a look. Are we going to do a sales returns and allowance for 45 Or are we going to do a purchase returns and allowances for 45 B. B. Right, because we are returning to the vendor for a full credit. So in this case, we are the buyer. So we're going to be doing a purchase returns and allowances for $45. Okay. So again, this. I have a question. Yes. So is that from June 15 where, you, where your items were actually at a 5% discount? So wouldn't it be less that you're receiving back? 
This is assuming that there are different scenarios. Meaning like okay, this, so yeah, that. they're not together. Like you didn't take the discount and then you end up returning. No, this is just separate discount. I mean, separate, separate scenarios. Because I wrote if. Okay. okay. If. Um, but in this case, like the second one right here, the fifty-two fifty, um, that comes from if you if you used the freight price, which is a dollar seventy-five, and you calculated the refund on that. So, in this case, assuming that there are different scenarios. Now, of course, for the exam, I'm not going to give you something like that. Um, I'm going to give you more. So I'm just giving you practice on the returns and allowances. I'm not going to test you in the inventory worksheet for the returns and allowances, but I will test you on questions just like this where you need to determine to me what the discount is or what the terms are and what, um, in case you return something, what are your returns and allowances, things like this. But I'm not going to test you in the actual inventory worksheet. All right, question number 39, okay, on June 24th, okay, a customer returns 20 toys for, because they're defective, okay, and of course you give him a full refund. What should be the correct entry? So let's take a look on June 24th. Assuming that we sold on June 20th, Okay, we sold 250 toys at $5 each with no sales tax. So if this person is returning, okay, 20 of those toys, what is the amount of uh, refund that you're going to give back to this customer? 100. 100. So in this case, right, 20 times... Five dollars, which gives you a hundred dollars. So in this case, right, there's no tax. So the assumption here is that you are going to be giving the refund back. Now, is it a sales returns and allowances or is it a purchase returns and allowances? Sales. Sales. So in this case, it's going to be D sales returns and allowances for a hundred. Dollars. Okay, I'm trying to push it uh, forward so you can see all the answers. But in this case, that's what you have to do. Okay. Last question here, question forty for um, this entire scenario. Um, if okay, there was um, a store-wide sale. Okay, on all toys are forty percent off on June twentieth. Okay, what? is the discount um, amount. What is the discounted amount? So, okay, separate scenario. Okay, if there was a sale on June 20th, which we take a look, we sold 250 toys at $5 each. Okay, so what is the discounted amount if you took 40% off for the store-wide sale? So you take 250 times $5. 1,250. 1,250, right? And you're going to multiply that by... The 40%. So what is the discounted amount? Oh, 500. It's going to be $500. Okay, so in this case, the discounted amount, is it going to be a sales discount or is it going to be a purchase discount? Sales. Sales, sales because you're selling it to the customer. So in this case, sales discount for 500 hundred dollars okay. 
All right, last question here, which is uh, for the chapter six, which is the lower cost of market. So again, I will be providing these six things here. In this case, there's only five. You don't need the you don't need the profit percentage. Okay. If I bought something original price for three dollars and seventy five cents, okay, the replacement cost is going to be three dollars and sixty six cents. The I sell this for eight dollars. The cost of disposal is going to be seventy seven cents, and the amount of profit is three dollars and forty five cents. So, what is going to be my ceiling price? Uh, 723. 723. How did you get that? Um, selling price uh, minus the um, uh, uh, cost of disposal. Okay, so you're going to take $8. Eight dollars minus your disposal of seventy-seven cents to get a total of seven dollars and thirty-four cents. You said twenty-four cents, thirty-four. Uh, twenty-three. Okay, yeah, I can't do math. Okay, twenty-three. Good. Okay, how do you solve for the floor? Uh, ceiling price minus amount of profit. So see, so ceiling of two twenty three minus my profit of three forty five. What do I get? Uh, three seventy eight. Three seventy eight. So question here is, let's compare. Okay, compare. I have my ceiling of seven twenty three. I have my uh, floor of three seventy eight, and then I have my replacement cost at three sixty six. Which one's in the middle? The three sixty six. Three sixty six is in the middle. Let's try that again. Is 366 what? greater oh, than? 378. Oh. Good. Uh. No worries. All right, here you go. 378. So this becomes my market. So the last question asks, which one's lower? Right? That's the question I'm going to ask. Which one's lower? Is it going to be the original cost of 375 or my market price of 378? Sorry, what was the question? Which one is lower? Lower cost, uh, the, original yeah, cost from the market? Uh, the uh, original cost. Original cost of $3.75. Okay. So once again, you have about a billion different um, exercises on the lower cost of market in the chapter 6, uh, chapter 6, um, 6.4 exercise again. There's a bunch of exercises that you have throughout all of the uh, scenarios that we've done. Okay, so again, use that as to your advantage for the exam. Okay, so once again, um, this is just an extra set of more examples that help you practice what's going to be on the exam. Okay, so that's it for the study guide review. Again, I'm going to go over what I have on the Google Classroom for you, just as a friendly reminder, okay? So again, I've uploaded to you your test one scratch sheets, okay? Whether you wanna uh, download it as a Word, PDF, or Excel, okay? So in this case, right, if you just take a look at, I'm gonna go ahead and use the PDF version. You look at the PDF version, you have, one, you have two, and you have three periodic inventory tables. Because I told you on the exam, I'm going to test you all three methods, okay? Here, you also have space for your journals, okay? Because I could ask you for um, like a scenario, right? Journalize this scenario, okay? 
What happens if it's a if you if you purchased it on using the net method? What happens if you purchase it using the gross method? Et cetera, et cetera, right? What happens when you use a purchase discount or you have a returns and allowances? I can ask you almost anything because that's pretty much the majority of the journalizing that we've done in this class, right? We looked at periodic inventory, how to purchase it, how to return it. We also looked at sales, how to purchase, how to sell the item and how to return the item. Okay, so I gave you room for all those journals for you to jot down your ideas and practice. I even provided a table for you for your lower cost of market. And that is it for this exam, okay, for calculation wise. Now, I've also told you that this is probably, uh, let me see, if, if the periodic inventory tables, right, each have roughly two to three questions, right, that's about nine questions right there. Plus the lower cost of market is just going to be one more question. So that's only 10 questions right there. Now, of course, I'm also going to test you on conceptual based questions because chapters one through four is all concepts. OK, so take the study guide as a, you know, a means for you to help you study. I have all the quizzes here, too, if you need to go over the quizzes so you can study uh, for the exam that way. OK, um, and all the exercises have the answers on there, too. So if you feel that you need to go over and practice more, it's all there. OK, I will be uploading the study guide answers to the study materials. OK, so you'll have it there. OK, um, and yes, yeah, so everything on the Google Classroom is free for you to use on the exam. And I expect you to actually use everything on the Google Classroom to help you for the exam. OK, it's open book, open note, open lecture videos, open lecture notes, whatever it is that you need to use for the exam. OK, so any questions so far in regards to the exam? Again, reminder, um, there is no class tomorrow because you're either going to be taking your exam, study for the exam or so on and so forth. Right. You have three days to take the exam Thursday at 8 a.m. It's going to start. You don't need to take it at 8 a.m. You can take it at 5 p.m. on uh, Thursday if you like. Whenever you start, just know that your time, there's no time limit, so you can stay on the exam as long as you don't exit the page or refresh the page for any reason, okay? And you could stay on there for as long as you need, okay? Now, again, recommendation is I wouldn't recommend you to stay on a page for too long um, just because the, uh, the way that Orban works is if you stay idle on a page for too long, it will kick you out. OK, so again, you have three attempts and the exams is open starting at 8 a.m. on Thursday and it ends Saturday at midnight. So please do not take the exam Saturday at 10 o'clock unless you think you're confident enough to answer all the questions, um, all 50 questions uh, within that two hour period. But I do recommend you to uh, kind of uh, take a look at the exam first and kind of go through it and go through the questions one at a time, okay? Other than that, any other questions in regards to, to the exam? Mm, no. Okay, so again, no class tomorrow, okay? But I will count uh, tomorrow uh, and Friday uh, 